We'll get started. Uh, Father, we're just grateful for today and grateful for a lot of things, Uh, particularly this uh, time of the year where we um, uh, really, the month of November, just really focus on um, our blessings. So you've blessed us with so many things, Father. Um, I just pray today would be a reminder of that, um, that we would leave uh, here people with an attitude of gratitude. It's so easy to focus on what's wrong in our lives and not focus on the many things that you've done for us. And so help us to have that frame of mind. As we gather as your people today and look into your word, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles, if we could, to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, and verse 10. There should be a handout floating around back there somewhere if you need one. And we were sort of uh, continuing on with our study on angelology. Um, Having covered the good angels, we moved into a key evil angel, Satan. And if time permits, we're going to actually be moving into demonology today. We'll have to see how it goes. But when we look at uh, Satan, we looked at his existence, uh, his personhood, his names and titles, his original state and first sin, and from there we started to look at his works, and actually actually we didn't start to look at his works, we've been looking at his works uh, in depth, past, present, and future. So we've gone through most of the things that Satan has done in the past. We've taken a look at the things he's doing right now in the present, and that's a lot of stuff. And then I think it was last week we started to um, take a look at his future. Uh, What does the future have in store for Satan? And um, unless uh, you understand the future of Satan, you really can't make sense of the world that we're living in. And you can't really make sense of the intensity of the hatred that Satan has for the human race. So why is Satan such a ferocious opponent of the human race? Why does he try to keep people in darkness? Why does he try to keep people from coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? It really relates to his future. And so some of the things he will do in the future are, and we've covered these last time, orchestrate a world government. He will actually oppose the bodily return of Jesus. He will attempt to annihilate and exterminate the nation of Israel. And yet, what does the future say? The kingdom of God, through great warfare, is going to come to the earth anyway. And it's during that time period that Satan will be bound for a thousand years. So we see the binding of Satan is yet future when the kingdom comes, which helps us a great deal in spiritual warfare because a lot of people are binding Satan now in their prayer life, which is an exercise really in futility, (laughs) since we know from the Bible that only Christ is going to bind Satan permanently, and that doesn't come until the kingdom arrives. At the end of that kingdom age, he's going to lead a final rebellion. Uh, He comes out of his abyss, and he deceives the nations again. And... We talked a little bit at the end, kind of had to jam it in, unfortunately, but the rebels there in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9, are basically the mortal descendants of those who survived the tribulation period. So the millennial kingdom, and I'll try to make reference to this uh, in the sermon today, but the millennial kingdom is sort of an interesting time period where you have resurrected and non-resurrected people dwelling together. 
So we as members of Christ's church who receive our resurrected bodies at the point of the rapture will actually return with Jesus in those resurrected bodies to rule and reign with him as he delegates authority to us in the millennial kingdom. So since we will be in resurrected bodies, we won't be involved in that final rebellion. But you'll have a different category of people that survive the tribulation period. Some of them are believers. They're deemed to be sheep. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. So they enter the kingdom in mortal, non-resurrected bodies. They have children. Their children have children. Their children have children. The earth gets repopulated. And what just got passed down through the genetics? The sin nature. So when Satan is released at the end of that thousand year time period and he incites a rebellion, Revelation 20 verses 7 through 9, he's actually inciting mortals who have lived in perfection for a thousand years. And one of the points I tried to make really fast at the end last time is that this is one of the reasons God allows this era of history to elapse. One of the things to understand about God is history is pedagogical. Pedagogy is teaching. God allows eras of history to elapse to teach humanity certain lessons. So God is always teaching. Uh, He teaches in didactic form in his word, but he also teaches through uh, allowing eras and epics to, to transpire. So one of the things that's happening today is God is pouring out his grace on a group of people that's, and the grace is being poured out in a way that's, that's unprecedented. And that's us. That's the church. Uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So, so many Christians try to come before God and they kneel and they say, Lord, I just want you to bless me. Bless me, bless me, bless me. And God is basically in heaven saying, well, you need to read the owner's manual. Uh, you're already maxed out in terms of your blessings. Uh, there's, I can't make you any richer than you already are, in other words. And that's what the book of Ephesians, particularly the first three chapters, is about. So you ask yourself, why has God allowed this era of unprecedented grace to take place. It's been happening for 2,000 years. Well, history is pedagogical. And one of the things that's happening is God is using this era to fill out knowledge of the grace of God in the angelic world. And that's why when you read passages like Ephesians 3, verse 10, 1 Peter 1, verse 12, you see that the angels are watching. The angels are not omniscient. They're created beings, so they have to study and learn. The plan of salvation, if we have time, we'll get to this today, related to demons. The plan of salvation is not open to angels, or else Jesus would have had to become an angel, right, and die on the cross, which he did not do. So the reason that the angels are studying us so intently is because they're learning something about God's character that they really don't know much about, which is his grace or unmerited favor. They know about his judgment because Lucifer rebelled and a third of their colleagues lost their positions in heaven. They know about his holiness because the seraphim, according to Isaiah 6, say what around the clock? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They know about his creative power because the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, talks about the angels praising God as God was creating all things in six days. So they understand his creative power, they understand his holiness, they understand his judgment. What they don't fully understand is his grace. And one of the reasons for that is there's no plan of salvation for the angelic world. So that's why the New Testament keeps portraying them as watching us all of the time. Because history is pedagogical. 
Uh, another example of history being pedagogical is the book of Judges. Have you read the book of Judges lately? Kind of sounds like the United States of America. It's uh, very, very depressing watching seven cycles of sin leading to consequences, leading to God's people crying out for help, leading to God raising up a judge, leading to freedom from oppression, leading to prosperity, and then the whole thing, <laughs> the whole thing happens again. And they go back into sin, oppression, and God raises up a judge after they cry out. And this happens in the book of Judges over a time period of 300 years. That's a lot of space chronologically. The United States of America, you know, is what, 243, something like that, 242 years old. We're talking about 300 years there. And this cycle happens not once, not twice, but seven times. And you read the book of Judges and it's so monotonous, it keeps happening. You say, well, God, why do you keep allowing this to take place? Well, history is pedagogical. And it's not until you get to the end of the book of Judges chapter 16, really 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, and you start seeing the reason why God allowed that 300 years to happen. Because it says in that section, if I remember right, about four times, there was no king in Israel in those days. What days? The 300 years I just explained. There was no king in Israel in those days, and so every man did what was right in his own eyes. So what God is explaining to Israel is the only way I can successfully govern you is through a king, which you don't have yet. Of course, that king ultimately is going to be Yeshua or Jesus Christ, but they have to have a king over them. And God could just come down and write on the sky or make some kind of, you know, audible expression, y- y'all need a king. Well, the problem is they don't understand that. They thought they were functioning fine under the judges' era. And so God says, fine, try it for 300 years and see how it works. <laughs> so God used history to teach, you see that? And a lot of people, it's, it's just sad to watch. They just act like the millennial kingdom is just no big deal and they just allegorize it and don't treat it with the respect that it deserves. But the millennial kingdom, like the judges era and like the church age, is an era of history where God is teaching humanity a lesson. And that lesson is evil does not come from the outside or the external. Evil comes from the heart. Now, how does God communicate that point? He lets them live, these mortals, and their descendants who have a sin nature, a thousand years in a perfect environment. So nobody during the millennial kingdom is going to be able to complain about climate change, lack of universal health care, minimum income for everyone, uh, you know, all these things people are always, racial bias, lack of social justice, structural bias. I mean, nobody's going to be able to complain about that because the environment that humans are living in is perfect, couldn't get more perfect. And yet, what do people do at the end when given the first opportunity? Satan is let loose from the abyss and he deceives the nations. It's sad to read it because it says those involved in the rebellion are as the sand of the seashore. And as that era of history transpires, God is saying, see, I told you. Uh, Your problem is not your environment. Your problem is your wicked heart. See that? So Christianity is not about fixing the environment. And that's the mistake of the social justice movement. They're getting all these churches involved in all of these sort of projects and causes. And the reality of the situation is you you can bring in a perfect environment, which man can't do anyway. Only Christ's kingdom can do it. And people can be as, as mean and as rotten as they've always been, living in a thousand years of perfection, 
because evil emanates from the heart. And that's why the message of Christianity is you need to be changed on the inside. That's the problem. The problem is I've got a nature that hates God that I inherited from Adam. And until that issue is rectified and no change in health care or education or the ozone layer or whatever people are into is going to fix that problem. It's only the new birth. And, th and that's why Jesus in his Nick at night, I call it, conversation with Nicodemus said, you must be born again to enter. So being born again is a change on the inside that only the Holy Spirit can give as people receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus is all about changing people on the inside. So um, how does God end up communicate, communicating this? History is pedagogical. He lets the millennial kingdom transpire to, to prove that point once and for all before human history as we know it ends. And this earth is then going to be replaced by a new heavens and a new earth. So our message today is totally different than what you're hearing from the politicians and liberal theologians who are always talking about fixing the outside. Lack of education, people say. Gosh, we could make crime disappear if we just educated everybody properly. Well, guess what happens when you educate a blue-collar thief? He becomes a white-collar thief. I mean, you give an education to a thief, and the only thing you've really done is you've enhanced his capacity to steal. See that? So more education, pouring more and more dollars into education is not going to solve anything. In fact, it might even make things worse because you're giving wicked people more tools through which to you know, engage in their wickedness. And the, the world system does not understand this message at all. We understand it because we're Bible readers. And God is going to prove it once and for all by allowing the millennial kingdom to elapse because history is pedagogical. And that is one of the reasons that when you read Revelation 19, around verse 20, what you see is when Jesus comes back, he takes the beast and the false prophet and he throws them into the lake of fire. So they're done. I mean, we might even say they're well done, but they're, they're, <laughs> they're finished, it's over for them. Oh, and by the way, they don't disintegrate and disappear. Because a lot of people today, the Jehovah's Witnesses and even some evangelicals are teaching annihilationism. Meaning that when you go into hell, you just disappear. No, because when you get to Revelation 20 verse 10, which we're going to look at in just a second. Satan is thrown to where the beast and the false prophet are. It doesn't say were. This is where they are. Now that's a thousand years later, they're still in there. So you'll notice what God does. He takes the beast and the false prophet, puts them, Revelation 19, verse 20, they're the first uh, folks that enter the lake of fire. But Satan is not put into the lake of fire. Satan is put into a different place called the abyss. Revelation 20 verses two and three. And you say, well, why, didn't, why doesn't God just come back and put everybody in the lake of fire? I mean, we call these guys the unholy trinity, right? Beast, false prophet, Satan. Why doesn't he just throw all of them into the lake of fire simultaneously? Because history is pedagogical. God still has one more purpose for Satan before he joins his companions in the lake of fire. And God is going to actually use Satan for the pedagogical purpose of proving the true nature of man. That man is, is wicked from the inside. That, that wickedness is inside of people. And all they need is an opportunity to express it. So Satan is sort of like a, a, a slide, if you will, on God's PowerPoint. He's gotten through the part of the PowerPoint presentation dealing with 
the dragon, excuse me, the, false pro, uh, the beast and the false prophet. So God has finished using them as teaching devices. But he's got one more slide for Satan. So he keeps him around for a thousand years in solitary confinement. And then he lets him loose. And it's a fascinating study to see how sovereign God is over Satan. And how God is actually using Satan for God's own purposes. Because a lot of people have this idea, and we've covered this, between God and Satan, that they're basically equally matched. And that's called dualism. In other words, God has a rival. It's like Rocky and Apollo getting into the ring. We don't know who's going to win. And a lot of people look at the battle between God and Satan that way. And actually, what your Bible teaches is this is no contest. For the simple reason that Satan is a created being. And God, in fact, is so much in control of things that he's actually using his arch enemy as a point in his PowerPoint presentation. And so that's why Satan is not thrown into the lake of fire immediately, but is kept into this place called the abyss because God has one more purpose for Satan. And so it's a wonderful reminder because evil we see all around us and we get somewhat despondent about that and we lose sight of the fact that we're on the winning side of history god is completely in control of everything even how even over his his greatest adversary the devil so these are all the things satan will do he will lead a final rebellion and then the last thing that will happen to him and this is where i had you open up to Revelation 20 verse 10, when all of this is over and history has taught its lessons, he takes Satan and he throws him into the lake of fire finally. And that's what you're reading there in Revelation 20 verse 10. It says, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, watch this now, where the beast and the false prophet, now how did they get in there? They were put in there a thousand years earlier. Where the beast and the false prophet, what's the next word? Are. They're still in there. So annihilationism obviously isn't true. Or else these guys would have exploded or disappeared or disintegrated a long time ago. Where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night for how long? Forever and ever. That's an awful long time. And so this is the end of Satan here. And we learn from many, many passages, like, for example, feel free to follow me around, at least in your Bible. (laughs) Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Actually, Matthew chapter 25, I I think I want verse, yeah, 41, let's try that. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for those terrible human beings. Doesn't say that, does it? Which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So one of the things to understand about hell is it was never originally created for people. And yet, if people will willfully reject the grace of God and cooperate with Satan, they end up sharing in his fate, even though hell itself was not originally created for them. And let me tell you something. This is probably one of the reasons that Satan doesn't want Bible prophecy taught in local churches. We get umpteen emails weekly from people saying, I can't find a church that teaches Bible prophecy. The reason for that is the devil doesn't want this book taught. Because think about it for a minute. Would you want a book taught that spells out your demise prophetically? I mean, if there was some book that God wrote that spelled out how my life was going to end in tragedy, I wouldn't want anything to do with that book. I would do everything in my power not to let that book get into print let alone read. 
And so this is one of the reasons why Bible prophecy, you know, people that teach it and churches that embrace it are sort of in the minority. But it's because Satan is well aware of these prophecies. In fact, when you go over to Matthew 8, verse 29, something very interesting is said here. And they cried out, now that would be the demons. These are the demons talking. The demons have more theological awareness than most pastors and elders and deacons. The demons have more theological awareness than most seminary professors. Because when you look at what they say, if they submitted this comment to me for a grade, I'd have to give them an A+. Because what these demons say is completely accurate. Matthew 8, 29, and they, that's the demons, cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? Now look at that. That's a pretty high Christology there. They know exactly who Jesus is. God in human flesh. What business do we have with each other, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? What time? the time in history where God prophetically fulfills his word. So notice that they believe in prophecy. They believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They may even have a, a belief in the Trinity. And they, they believe very clearly there's a coming day of judgment. And they know they're going to be judged. So they just kind of concede these things openly and matter-of-factly. And when you understand this, that you're dealing with a foe that is defeated, you understand his total hatred for the human race and why he does everything within his power to keep people from coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus because why would he want any created being, humanity included, to enjoy something throughout eternity that he will have no part of. You see that? And if you're, the, the most desperate people in the world are people they're, that know they're going down. I mean, they know they're going down. So their mindset is, okay, if I'm going down and that can't be reversed, I'm just gonna pull as many people with me as I possibly can. And that's the mindset of the enemy. And you can't understand that mindset unless you become a student of Bible prophecy. So that sort of completes our list there of the future of Satan. And one of the things I want to communicate is this list here. Which shows you, and I've preached a sermon on this. It's somewhere in our sermon archives somewhere. I've preached a sermon on this because it deals with the sevenfold defeat of Satan. A lot of people have this idea that Satan is defeated in one foul swoop. They just think he's defeated in Revelation 20, verse 10. No, that's stage seven of a sixfold, sevenfold variety in which Satan's defeat is accomplished by God in seven stages. And we are if you want to understand where we're living, we're living in between number four and number five. So what are those seven stages? Stage number one was his initial eviction from heaven. We've studied those passages, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, and Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 17. He is cast out of heaven. Number two, after the fall of man, he's defeated in Eden because in his presence, a prophecy was given, sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, which means first gospel, which is your first formal proclamation of the gospel to the, to the fallen human race ever. And that's in Genesis 3, verse 15. In fact, Genesis 3, verse 15, may very well be the most important verse in the whole Bible. Because the rest of the Bible is an unpacking of Genesis 3, verse 15. 
Everything that happens in subsequent scripture is related to a conflict that God explained would take place with Satan in Genesis 3 verse 15, ultimately leading to his ultimate demise. So right out of the gate, his doom is announced. And you remember Genesis 3 verse 15. What does it say there? God says to the serpent, who had just beguiled Eve and ultimately Adam, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now the woman is Eve. Between your seed and her seed. In other words, we have seed or descendants of Satan, and then we have seed or descendants of Eve. He shall bruise you on the head. Now who would this he be? He shall bruise you on the head. This would be the coming one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Who is going to take Satan's head and crush it. And we all know that when your head is crushed, you're finished, right? But along the way, Satan, you're going to be able to inflict a lot of what we would call collateral damage. Because the rest of the prophecy is you shall bruise him on the heel. In other words, there's coming one into the human race who's going to take Satan's head and crush it, and Satan is going to do everything within his power to try to stop that one from being born. And once he is born, I'll try to do everything within my power to prevent him from accomplishing his mission, such as, for example, offering him all the kingdoms of the world and other things that Satan did with Jesus. Now, most people, it's like going into a movie. You go into a movie, you're five minutes late. Actually, this day and age, being five minutes late to a movie doesn't hurt much because I went to a movie recently and I timed the commercials. (laughs) And they went 27 minutes. So if you're late to a movie today, no big deal. But let's say you arrive 35 minutes late instead of 27. So you miss the first eight minutes of the movie and you miss some kind of critical piece of information given at the beginning. Has that ever happened to anybody? And so everything's happening in the movie and you're not connecting the dots. You don't know why things are happening. Whereas if you'd paid attention at the beginning or been present at the beginning, the rest of the movie would have made perfect sense. That basically is Genesis 3 verse 15. Because most Christians are on their one year reading plan which is not a bad thing, you know, through the Bible in a year. And so they've got to get through a certain number of chapters that day. So they're, they're really just rushing to get through it, to mark that off their spiritual list, did that today. And they're reading Genesis 3, and they read Genesis 3. It seems kind of odd to them, but they just read right over it, and they don't understand it. And therefore, they don't understand what just, what's going to happen in Genesis 4, where Cain kills his brother. Well, that's weird. I mean, why would Cain just rise up and kill his brother? Well, 1 John tells you exactly why Cain did that. He was being influenced by the evil one. And Cain did that as an outworking of Genesis 3, verse 15, because God, uh, excuse me, Satan was using Cain to kill Abel to stop the birth of the Messiah. Uh, You remember Abel's sacrifice is accepted, Cain's sacrifice is rejected. So Satan probably figured at that point, well, this Messiah, who I know is coming, because he's announced in Genesis 3, verse 15, is going to come through Abel's line. So Satan uses Cain through jealousy to murder his brother. And God, as he always does, gets around the satanic strategy with an alternative plan. In this case, it was the birth of Seth. See that? And your whole Bible is going to start reading this way. Genesis 4 is just the the first example of it. But you have multiple examples of what I'm talking about as you move through the Bible. And so Genesis 3 verse 15 lays out the script And the rest of the Bible is just filling in the details. So it's announced 
right at the beginning that Satan is defeated. So number two, he is defeated in Eden. Now, we're not going to get into details about this because we have a whole series of lessons coming on this in our angelology study. But one of the things Satan tried to do in Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, is he tried to impregnate uh, human women to contaminate the genetics of the human race to prevent the birth of who? This Messiah that's announced in Genesis 3, verse 15. He created what's called the Nephilim, which means fallen ones, because he knows from this passage that this Messiah is coming from the seed of the woman. Who is the woman? The woman is Eve. So therefore, the Messiah must be fully human, right? In addition to being fully God. So Satan says, well, I'll fix this problem. I'll create a race of people that aren't fully human. A hybrid race, partly angel, partly human, and that's why they're called the Nephilim, the fallen ones, because he's trying to lock the human race into a permanent fallenness. He's trying to create a genetic climate whereby the Messiah can never come. See that? And that's why there's all this information in Genesis 6. I want to say it's around verse 9, how Noah was perfect and blameless in his generations. And everybody looks at that and says, wow, what a great guy Noah was. When Genesis 6, around verse 8, verse 9, says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a sinner just like anybody else. And after all, it was Noah in the post-flood world that it was in a drunken state. So when it says Noah was blameless and perfect in his generations, it's not a statement about his morality. It's a statement about his genetics. In fact, when we get to that section, I'll show you that one of the Hebrew words used there is used of the genetic purity of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12, verse 5. The Passover lamb had to be genetically pure. No spots, blemishes, etc. And so <laughs> we're not talking about the morality of the Passover lamb. We're talking about the genetic purity of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12. And one of those words is used of Noah. So Noah and his family, apparently, were one of the few that were uncontaminated by this genetic experiment. And so when God brought the flood, he did it to, first of all, destroy the hybrid race, the Nephilim. And he did it to preserve Noah genetically because through Noah's descendant or son, Shem, is going to come who? The Messiah or the fulfillment of Genesis 3, verse 15. So what's going on in Genesis 6 is another outworking of the seed of the woman, seed of the serpent conflict announced in Genesis 3, verse 15. So you don't understand Genesis 3, verse 15. You don't understand Genesis 4. You don't understand Genesis 3, verse 15. You don't understand Genesis 6. And I could make the case that you can't understand almost anything in the Bible without understanding Genesis 3, verse 15. Uh, 15. So Satan, it was one of his strategies to prevent the Messiah from being born. And God, just like he got around the Genesis 4 issue through the birth of Seth, got around the Genesis 6 issue through the protection of the genetic purity of Noah. So Satan lost round two. So one of the things that happened is the angels, or the demons involved in that particular Genesis 6 sin were put in prison. When we get to demonology, I'll show you very clearly, the Bible tells you that some demons are in jail. Some are free. Because Ephesians 6 verse 12 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. So you've got some demons in jail, some free, and if you don't have angelology in Genesis 6, you don't have any explanation as to why some are incarcerated and some are free. And that's why when the Bible mentions those demons in jail, 
it connects it with the days of Noah, which I won't be going into today, but I'll show you that when we get to uh, that particular section of teaching material. So the angels that were involved in the Genesis 6 sin were not all of Satan's demons, but some of them. And because they left their natural abode and did something completely heinous, in this case trying to contaminate the genetics of the human race, they received an immediate punishment from God or they went into immediate incarceration. So Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, in between his crucifixion and resurrection, went to where those incarcerated demons who sinned in Noah's day are. And he preached, 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, victory over them. Now, when people see that word preach, they think, well, Jesus went to evangelize people in hell and they come up with all these explanations. It's not talking about humans in hell. It's talking about demons in incarceration because of what happened in Genesis 6. And the verb there is not, in Greek, euangelizo, which is the verb for evangelism. The verb that's used there is the verb caruso, which means to herald or proclaim. So what Jesus did in between his death and his resurrection is he descended to where these demons are in jail and he proclaimed to them that they lost. They lost what? They lost in their attempt to prevent the birth of the Messiah because that's what's happening in Genesis 6. The Messiah was born. And we're coming up on Christmas, and that's what you ought to be thinking about on Christmas time. That God somehow, despite all of these satanic attempts, allowed his Messiah to be born. It's a, it's a miracle. And so Jesus, in between his crucifixion and resurrection, descended to where these spirits, and spirits is always de- uh, angels or fallen angels, descended to where these spirits are locked up and he proclaimed to them that they lost. And so that's round three that Satan lost. See that? And then number four, we know what Jesus did on the cross, that his sacrificial death bridged the gap between fallen humanity and a holy God, making the opportunity for human salvation possible And so by believing the gospel as a human being, I, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, am delivered from the fear of death that has haunted human beings their whole lives. And all of those passages I have there on number four, I wish we had time to look at every single one of them, show the defeat that Satan experienced through the death, the sacrificial death, and then authenticated Because anybody can die, right? It's quite a different deal if someone says they're going to die and says they're going to rise from the dead and then says, I'm attaching the weight of the sin of the world to my sacrificial death. Anybody can say that, but only God can actually rise from the dead and, and authenticate the whole thing. So Satan suffers defeat number four at that point. Now that's all in our past. Defeat five is where Satan, Revelation 12 verse nine, is evicted from heaven permanently. And you say, well, wait a minute, I thought, number one, you said he was initially evicted from heaven, and he was. But apparently he can still go into heaven, not to worship and serve as he once did as a high-ranking angel, but to communicate and accuse. Job 1 and 2, the earliest book of the Bible that we have, talks about how Satan made his presence to God amongst the other sons of God, angels, and made an accusation against Job. So obviously Satan can go into heaven to do this. We know this from the New Testament because uh, Jesus said to Peter in Luke 22, I think it is, 
Simon, Simon, Satan has requested permission to sift you as wheat. That would be a pretty scary conversation. But then Jesus says, I prayed for you. And I'd be like, whew, thank you. (laughs) So clearly he has some kind of access to heaven. But what you learn in Revelation 12 verse 9 is that access disappears. When does it disappear? It disappears the moment the beast desecrates the temple. Exactly three and a half years or 42 months into the tribulation period. And that's why Revelation 12 portrays Satan, beginning around verse 9, as plummeting to the earth, knowing he has but a short time. What short time are we talking about? Well, the tribulation period is seven years. The beast desecrated the temple midway through the tribulation period. So how much time does Satan have left? Three and a half years left, or sometimes the Bible says use the synonym 42 months. Sometimes it'll use the synonym 1,260 days. Sometimes it'll use the synonym a time, times, and a half a time. A time is a Jewish year, times, plural, two Jewish years, half a time, half a Jewish year, What's one plus two plus one half? That's three and a half years, right? So these are all synonyms that are being used. These are all synonyms that are essentially being employed to explain that second half of the tribulation period. So midway through the tribulation period, Satan loses the access that he had to communicate and accuse And he does, as desperate people do, the only thing he's got left in his playbook, which is to gobble up Israel because he knows that through Israel the kingdom will come. But he suffers a defeat there. And then when he fails to gobble up Israel, and the Jews, a third of them anyway, acknowledge Yeshua as their savior, And Jesus returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation period to rescue the nation of Israel and consequently sets up his kingdom, moving us into Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. The sixth part of Satan's defeat is he's incarcerated in a place called the abyss for a thousand years while the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, why, once again, is Satan incarcerated and yet the beast and the false prophet are put into the lake of fire? Because God has one more purpose for Satan, which we've explained earlier, because history is what? Pedagogical. God still has one more point on his PowerPoint slide to make. And he needs Satan around long enough to do it. But once God finishes the lecture, hit click, Satan is, you don't need the PowerPoint slide anymore. Satan is thrown to where his companions are, not were, are. And so that takes us to number seven, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, where he will then be thrown into the lake of fire. So all of this is explaining that Satan throughout biblical history is not destroyed in one foul swoop. It happens progressively. So when you read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you have to see in it not just one whack and it's over. What you have to see in it is a progressive defeat. And Satan is trying to stop this process from happening. And that's the significance of the heel being bruised. Now, if your heel is bruised, you can recover from that, can't you? But if your head is crushed, can you recover? You can't recover. So Satan, you're going to be able to cause your problems and you're going to be able to inflict momentary damage, but your ultimate defeat, the destruction of your head, is on the horizon. So where are we living today? Because everybody always wants to know, how does this relate to me, right? Well, here's how it relates to you. We're living in between numbers 1 through 4, after number 4, but before numbers 5, 6, and 7. So we're living in between the fourth and the fifth stage. 
which means we're living in a time period, and here's an analogy that I like to use from the legal world, and it's the only one that makes sense to me, probably because of my training as a lawyer, and those of you that like this, fine, if not, just discard it, but we're living in between conviction and sentencing. That's what we're living in between. Because when someone is accused of a crime, then they're tried by a jury of their peers. And if they are convicted by that jury beyond a reasonable doubt, they become a con at that point. They are convicted. So they're defeated. And if you've actually watched someone in a courtroom that <laughs> has, you know, I, I did jury duty not long ago. I was on a case and the uh, defendant, you just look at his body language when the jury comes in with, with their verdict. I mean, the guy just slumped over in his chair and he was just the most uh, despondent person visually I could think of at that moment. And that's where Satan is. He's convicted. The conviction is in. Which means the only thing the convict has left to look forward to, and I don't even like to use use the word look forward to, but the only thing that awaits on his horizon is what? The sentencing. Because the conviction stage, or what we call the guilt phase, and the sentencing phase are typically, at least this is how it worked in California, two different parts of a trial. So after the individual, after the accused has been convicted, then you have a separate phase of the trial called the sentencing phase where the judge assigns sentence. So what has happened to Satan is, is he has been convicted, but we don't have the sentence yet imposed. The sentence won't start getting imposed until numbers 5, 6, and 7. You see that? Which helps you understand the mindset of Satan. He's going down. So his goal is to take as many people down with him as he possibly can. Now, the analogy in the Bible that's given to us by the Holy Spirit to show us typologically of the time period that we're in between conviction and sentencing is the Saul-David narrative. If you understand the Saul-David narrative, you'll ex understand exactly where we are in human history. So you remember David was anointed as the next king of Israel, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, and he didn't immediately take the throne, did he? Because someone else was on the throne. And who was that? Saul, who had the Holy Spirit withdrawn from him, 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, so Saul is governing the, the, the nation without the anointing of God. Saul is consequently an, an illegitimate usurper for the simple reason that the kings are supposed to come from which tribe? Judah, Genesis 49, verse 10. What was Saul's tribal heritage? He was a Benjamite. He, ne he never should have been on the throne to begin with. 1 Samuel 9, verse 21. So here's the scenario. David is anointed as king, but is not yet ruling. Saul, an, an illegitimate usurper, is running the, the nation. So why did God allow that weird era of history to take place? Because history is what? Pedagogical. God was putting the nation through its paces, so to speak. If people walked by faith, they followed David. That's why there's all this information, you know, about uh, God doesn't look at the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. If you want to align yourself with David, you've got to walk by faith. And a minority within the nation of Israel did that. They're called David's mighty men. But if you walk by sight, you followed who? Saul, and that's why the Samuel books, particularly 1 Samuel 9, verse 2, keeps commenting on Saul's appearance. You read that and you say, why do I care what the guy looks like? 
because that's the basis on which you followed him. You followed him by sight. And sadly, the majority in the nation of Israel during that transitionary time period followed Saul. So now take exactly what I said and transfer it to today. It's exactly what's happening right now. Jesus, like David, has been anointed as king of this earth. When did he get that anointing? I would guess at his resurrection or ascension. You'll see Psalm 2, verse 7, Psalm 110, verse 1. So Jesus is the anointed king, but he is not now ruling the earth because an illegitimate usurper is on the throne, a Saul-like character called who? Satan, and Satan should have never been given authority over this earth to begin with. He's an illegitimate ruler. Why? Because God originally assigned the authority over the earth to Adam. So here I am in the exact same situation. Jesus is the anointed king, and I've got an illegitimate ruler on the throne. So if I follow Jesus, I walk by faith. That's the only way you could do it. Because you don't see anything in your eyesight that would give you the impression that Jesus is ruling now, and he's going to rule one day. So if I come to Christ and accept him as my ruler now, I have to do it completely by faith. Just like David's men had to trust that God was going to one day raise up David, and they did that totally by faith. And there is a minority of people today that are doing that. And that's why Jesus talked about the narrow road. Matthew 7, verse 14. Just like a, a narrow group of people accepted David, a narrow group of people are accepting Christ today. But if I follow Satan, I'm walking by, not by faith, but I'm walking by what? Sight. And this is why you run into all of these kinds of statements in the Bible, like 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, which say, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So in David's and Saul's time period, if you walked by sight, you followed Saul. If you walked by faith, you followed David. If you walk by sight today, you ignore Jesus. And you walk according to the pattern of this world, what you can see. But if you walk by faith, you follow Christ. The majority, just like back in the nation of Israel, was on the wrong road. Because they're walking by sight. A minority was on the right road, and that's exactly what's happening today. Majority is on the wrong road, a minority is on the right road. So, uh, goodness gracious, I was about as excited as anybody when I started to discover this type or this typology. I don't think it's unique to me. I think I've found reference to this in Alva J. McLean's book, The Greatness of the Kingdom. I just didn't see it fleshed out. Uh, the way I think it needs to be fleshed out is revealed in this chart form. So if you want to understand where we are in human history, we're right in between the anointing of David and yet we haven't had the dethronement of Saul yet. So we are living right in between the anointing of Christ, but Satan hasn't been dethroned yet. And why is God, back to my original point, why is he allowing this era of history to transpire? Because history is pedagogical. He's forcing, see what God's doing? He's forcing every person to choose. And every person, whether they know it or not, whether they're following Christ or following David, uh, following Christ or following Satan, is making a choice. If you ignore Christ, just like if you ignore David's anointing, that's a choice. See that? And so it's, a, it's, it's fascinating. So that takes us to the end of Satan. His existence, his personhood, his names and titles, original state, first sin, and works. And next week that I'm with you, we'll be moving into uh, demon, demonology. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful for 
your truth and the things that it reveals to us. Uh, Help us to understand the season that we're in according to your word so that we can be all that you'd have us to be in this age. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Happy intermission.